Good afternoon, everybody. We will be getting started here in just a few seconds. Welcome folks. I'm Selena Keneally, the Associate Director for New Mexico EBSCOR. And we are pleased to invite you uh, to host, our, we are pleased to host this webinar today um, run by the UI Collab. Uh, New Mexico EBSCOR's mission is advancing collaborative research in New Mexico. And this is a fantastic example of how New Mexico is, can increase their research footprint and innovation across the state. I'd like to introduce our host for today, Dr. David Hansen, who is the Assistant Vice President for Research at the University of New Mexico, as well as a biology professor. And he's the one that's been leading all of this ecosystem work. So um, just, uh, uh, Dave, I'm yes. gonna turn it on over to you. <laughs> great, thanks, Selena. And thanks for people for joining us. So um, it's really, it's it's great to, to have this opportunity. We've, I've, but Selena was, was mentioning, um, uh, after uh, I started um, really uh, participating in statewide stuff through EPSCOR um, as a as a fact of matter for, for a long time, uh, more recently since I, in the last three years when I've been assistant vice president for research, it's been to focus on trying to build uh, regional collaborations um, and work with other teams. Uh, we've been leading and participating in a range of different um, uh, uh, projects and, and trying to understand, um, you know, how to... Uh, have st state governments and, and city governments and other uh, organizations interact together, how to build in industry and university partnerships in that spot. A and a lot of this has been focused on these NSF engines programs, which are which are created this sort of whole ecosystem. Uh, and and, um, and in the process of going through that, that, that last one, uh, uh, an engines um, application last year, uh, and getting to the semifinalist stage, we realized that we... Um, really could use a bigger perspective and, and, a, and a good understanding of what else one was uh, successful um, and get um, more advice on how to do the things we've had a hard time with, which has been um, in, engaging with industry and, and engaging with and working with the with uh, government bodies to support this whole method. Uh, during that time here, I've also worked a lot with um, uh, UIDP, which is the which is the parent organization for the UI Collab, um, and understand learned a lot about the, the resources they have for helping universities and industries uh, partner around research uh, and and get some other bigger issues so we've we've reached out to um to have their uh, the ui collab um arm uh come and do some uh analyses for us to to give us this bigger picture of how others are doing this and and, and some and some thoughts on the the advice for, for for our ecosystem to go forward together on big proposals like these engines and so I'm super uh, happy um, that um, we, we were able to engage um, uh, UI Collab for doing this, and having uh, and that we had some funding uh, from the from the state um, through through and, and the federal government to help uh, make this happen through through our um, Rally West engine. So, um, so I'd like to introduce that we have today from UI Collab um, uh, Rob Lowe and Christina Thorsell, um, who have been um, who have. We've been some of the experts that we have in the, in this um, in the space, and have created this presentation. So go ahead, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thanks very much, uh, and uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here today to talk about some of the opportunity that we have um, uh, in front of us uh, for, for New Mexico. I'd like to uh, really just start with a brief overview of uh, what today's agenda is, and we have. Um, and enable the Q&A uh, function. So we'll uh, definitely uh, leave lots of time for questions and conversation at the end. This isn't intended to be a one-way dialogue. I'm hoping that just some of the slides that Christine and I present today will lead to um, a rich conversation at, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Let me uh, just first start with very brief overview of, of the project background and goals. Um, which led to us selecting a number of states that we would focus on uh, to provide data and process ar to, around how they approach economic development and what successes and, and challenges they've run into. 
And then we'll get into the findings uh, across those uh, case studies and then and then hopefully leave time for, for open discussion. So from a project background and goal uh, concept, let, let me just start with a map that I think uh, lays out um, how we should all be thinking about the opportunities ahead. So you'll see on the far right uh, of the slide is a number of re fairly recent um, large federal initiatives um, from engines, uh, which uh, Dave mentioned, obviously top of mind as, as we're coming into uh, the next round. Uh, the NIH REACH uh, program, uh, uh, research hubs uh, focus on several healthcare topics. Um, the EDA's tech hub system and supplemental system, their their um, grant system. i uh NSF engineering research centers, the CHIPS funding, Build Back Better Challenge. So lots of government programs uh, literally doling out tens of millions of dollars across a select number of hubs. And I'm going to keep coming back to that uh, in today's discussion that these are seen as hubs. Obviously, um, sometimes this, uh, th there's spokes uh, that, that are heavily involved uh, in many of the hubs, not all of them. Uh, and and uh, there is a lot of economic value in being the spoke, but being the hub is of course, getting to drive the real uh, mission of the state uh, as well as um, help determine um, how the next funding round will, will occur for that state. And we'll explain that in a second. So if I just start opening up, uh, the different programs we've seen. So we just went through the first round of engines. Um, those were distributed around the United States. The NIH REACH program a few years ago, uh, similar outcome. Um, the EDA Tech Hubs and Supplemental SDG program, i NSF, CHIPS, and Build Back Better. Um, what you'll see here is uh, if you, if you uh, look at certain pockets within the U.S., there are clear areas that have been successful in garnering uh, what seems to be kind of outsized amounts of program headquarters. So upstate New York, for example, um, Ohio has a number of big programs, North and South Carolina, um, et cetera. So we, we do see cases where there seems to be large funding initiatives from the federal government, and we'll talk a little about a few other related initiatives in a second, uh, going to what often seems um, a, a select number of organ of states or regions that uh, are able to get more uh, programs started than than uh, a uniform distribution across the United States might look like. And a big part of what we're thinking about now, of course, in this project is how does a state like New Mexico fit into this and where do we create the, the opportunity to really start that value chain of, of creating um, a successful proposal after successful proposal. So if I were to recast the project goal a little bit, you know, this started with uh, the engines um, uh, uh, preparation process for the next round, but this is a broader mission if you think about the last slide. And if you add in things like uh, attracting corporate headquarters or major research centers, like Intel's opening a, a fab in Ohio now, uh, several years ago, obviously BMW uh, moved their operations to South Carolina. There's lots of these examples where either um, corporate research movements or federal research dollars are, are coming into certain states. And so thinking about those more broadly, um, I would frame this as what economic gardening is needed for New Mexico to attract this federal and corporate investment. And this is a term that actually um, one of my colleagues in South Carolina who, who we interviewed for this uh, uh, uses, and I, I think it's really the appropriate um, the appropriate analogy as, as we go through some of the findings that this is really a long-term sort of gardening exercise, which includes lots of variables being managed um, in the process, just as, as when you, you grow a garden, uh, you have to plant the seed and, and wait some time for that, for that to mature. So the project process began with identifying some states that were comparable in characteristics to New Mexico. So there's obviously um, headline aspects which um, make New Mexico um, uh, unique in many ways. So a very good national lab system, uh, EPSCOR a state with opportunities there, et cetera. Uh, then there were also states that we thought about targeting who happen to have uh, aggressive um, economic development programs and initiatives. Since a big part of the economic gardening we'll find out is state and institution-led economic development initiatives. So we began to then gain insights into what are the contributing factors that enabled certain states to be successful in kind of these large scale initiatives. We interviewed over 30 people across um, six states, uh, including New Mexico. 
and um, analyzed a lot of data, which we'll we'll summarize um, today. So the and the real goal uh, as part of uh, this, not just uh, federal initiatives, is also corporate initiatives. So we'll assess uh, the the interest and incentives of of corporate partners we spoke with and and um, understanding their their role and their desire in a large scale regional initiatives. So let's spend a few minutes on how we selected the case studies because I think it's helpful to provide background as we go through the final learnings, but it's also helpful to think about what how we measure and how we think about the different states in relative comparison to each other and, and to New Mexico. So when we set out to select case uh, studies uh, for, for states or regions to follow, um, the first criteria we thought about was we should at least identify states that have been successful in NSF engines or at least similar levels of awards. An example we'll come to is Kentucky, which does not have an engine, but has re, uh, received a number of large uh, tech hubs from the EDA, from NIH and others. So uh, not an engine, but still been very successful in getting large dollar grant programs, tens of millions of dollars coming into the state. Um, second is to ensure that we're thinking about a comparable environment. Um, you know, obviously New Mexico has a lot of advantages and, and some aspects that are, are going to present roadblocks um, going forward. There, there's not a Silicon Valley uh, of that size in New Mexico. So California is not a, a good comparison, for example. And lastly, um, we sought to include the kind of creative, effective or, or ambitious programs that are programs that could be implemented uh, in, in New Mexico. So with these three categories, we put together um, a list, uh, a rank ordered list of criteria. Uh, so you'll see that we ranked them kind of primary rank. So uh, the first, first three were heavily weighted, secondary rank, and then tertiary rank at the bottom. So the primary rank were, you know, things that we really need to think carefully about and, and should drive the selection of, of case studies. Um, the second, uh, secondary were, um, were then moved um, uh, uh, to um, kind of rank two. So it's how we how we ranked um, and weighted the rankings in the tertiary, uh, obviously um, a, a lower ranking. Um, so the state scores, uh, and this is an eye chart, we'll obviously make it uh, available later. So this is sort of the top half of, of states. We, we ranked every state based on all these different criteria with particular weightings for um, uh, engines programs, major T beds or or EPSCOR. Uh, and so you'll see that um, those got uh, twos or ones. Um, so we we rated the amount of um, economic development activity. So technology based economic development activity T bed. Uh, we rated based on how much they were spending, um, either a two or one or a zero, and so on. And so uh, if we go left to right. Um, you'll see that uh, items got weighted uh, on a continuous uh, basis, resulting in a total score. So New Mexico, if you just kind of uh, scored New Mexico, you know, was an eight basically uh, on this. And, and three of the states we selected for the case studies um, happened to participate in, um, in NSF engines programs. Uh, so Louisiana and North Dakota were uh, leads and South Carolina is the lead in a shared program, uh, North and South Carolina on textiles. Um, and then we selected two other programs uh, that are were still fairly high up, uh, Kentucky and Ohio, uh, in part because they've received a lot of federal awards, um, but also because they have uh, much more mature economic development uh, programs that uh, almost anyone you talk to who's involved in this process have cited that as a key reason they've been so successful receiving these various federal award programs. So between these five states in yellow, um, we we sought to understand what is it that drove Louisiana to win an engine uh, award or uh, Kentucky to win the REACH and the EDA awards that, uh, that they did. So let's uh, start with findings. And obviously the, uh, this was a um, comprehensive uh, uh, process. And so in a slide here and there, we're not going to summarize every single aspect of, of how we looked at the case study. But what we're trying to do in, in each slide, one slide per state, is give a quick summary of uh, where they're at on the left. So what federal wins have we seen them have? Um, how is their state funding working in the economic development side? And who are key research partners in this process? And you'll see in a second, on the right side, we'll have kind of paraphrasing and indicative quotes of um, what uh, individuals thought were the most important aspects or attributes of that state's economy. I should I should point out that I keep saying state, although technically 
engines and other programs are considered regions. But experience shows that even though a region could be three to four states, uh, engines in particular has very few cases where uh, the engines award cross state boundaries. So North and South Carolina was together. Um, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin are in, in the water uh, program, although that's principally run out of out of Illinois. Uh, but otherwise, most programs are uh, particularly state driven uh, in the way that the Economic Development Agency can fund um, the region. Uh, and so that's a big part of why we're focusing on, on the states and not necessarily a cluster of, of states together. So, you know, Louisiana has uh, won a number of different uh, initiatives, as you saw on the map uh, at the beginning, but most principally it's its engine um, award. And one of the key things uh, that we've learned is Louisiana um, had a, a fairly large commitment at the state level and repeated, repeated uh, interviews showed this large level of funding was one of the essential reasons that they were able to uh, win the engine. Uh, and and some states' uh, applications struggled to identify state matching. They um, may have uh, pulled in funding from multiple sources. Uh, state of Louisiana had a line item budget in economic development for $67 million. Uh, and it was, you know, the NSF could just call one person and verify that this money is set aside. It wasn't, we're going to move some money out of this budget and move this money over here. And so that's something to think about. Um, and that's a theme we'll talk about in many states is the commitment and um, budget that is approved by the time that the state is applying for a particular federal program. So a couple of um, factoids about Louisiana. First is to think about the investment horizon. One of the key themes that we we found as, as we went through this process. So the investment horizon for those in, in Louisiana leading the, the um, Engines Award uh, program was really going back to 2010. So this is sort of a 12 to 14, 15 year program um, started by uh, their cited Stephen Moret, who, who eventually uh, moved to Virginia and, and was a key player in the Amazon process uh, headquarters move. But uh, this is a theme that, that you're, we're going to come back to many times that thinking about the, the longitude of economic development is not measured in months or year or a few years. It's, it's measured in a decade or more. Um, thinking about the gardening. So so uh, this is a great quote from, from Andy Moss, who was the PI on that engine. And, and many of you may know uh, Andy from, from Louisiana State uh, University. Um, but I, I think he, he really hit something uh, on, on the nose with this quote that you know, if you move the redwoods in California, Louisiana, they're not gonna make it because the problems or challenges or assets that California faces are not the same ones that Louisiana has. So his focus in not just going after um, the NSF engines program, but other programs, you know, they're building a large inc uh, physical incubator right now uh, next door to LSU's campus uh, and other aspects that are heavily involved in the EDA process. Um, so all of these are about, for Andy, defining what is the specific ecosystem that we have in Louisiana that can we can argue makes us unique. And we're not, we can't just go copy um, another state's a uh, problem statement or the, uh, ecosystem or structure, we have to define that ecosystem for us in a way that's uh, going to allow us to, to start this. Um, and although the uh, award is, uh, NSF Engine Award is, is not that old, um, he also made a point that they had to start that definition process three years ago. So long before the, the BAA or the, the uh, opportunity actually uh, uh, came out. The second key aspect that we took away from this um, case study was that early coordination was a fundamental feature of what they were working on. So I've talked to a number of states who were unsuccessful in the initial engines program uh, who had uh, less coordination, oftentimes uh, heavily competing um, applications from multiple institutions in the state um, for which as, as a reviewer, if, you, if you're the NSF or if you're applying to an EDA grant, if there's a lot of competition, there's not a lot of coordination, that's going to lower the likelihood that the whole state or the whole region can come together around a solution, especially given the um, size of Louisiana, for example. And so um, one of the key things they did early on was get coordination up front that Louisiana is the region, we're sticking with the state, 
Um, and every institution in the state from community colleges up to uh, Louisiana Tech, Tulane, LSU, the health, the health sciences centers will all be part of this solution. And we are going to leverage the relationships that places like LSU and, and Louisiana Tech have with the energy industry already, because that is our redwood forest. That is what we have that we can say is a, a unique aspect that is not replicable, as well as um, uh, a way to coordinate for a solution set. And so when we talk about coordinating, we're talking about regular communications. So they began about 18 months before um, the proposal was going to go in and met uh, roughly monthly, sometimes multiple times in a month. Uh, so about 25 um, actual convenings of participants. Those convenings included participating universities. They included state um, government. They included companies, obviously different institutions or uh, different organizations in that process are going to have different levels of roles. Uh, at the end of the day, LSU was the coordinating mechanism for everything going on. You have to have one strong leader. But uh, communication was essential and they they continued to communicate with, with everyone who could be a part of that. LSU itself had hired a staff um, to work around Andy and, and the other folks um, applying the project for everything that they needed to do. So it wasn't just Andy and, and um, uh, Dan Chance at, at Tulane, who's a co-PI, uh, trying to write everything up. There was a staff of people to help manage communications. They had an outside grant writing organization who was, who was writing the drafts of the grant. So they invested early on in building a team around this initiative um, that was focused on the initiative so that they could bring together a communication plan, uh, not just for how they uh, presented or, or submitted their proposal, but also how they communicated with other members, uh, stakeholders in the state. Now, I do want to be clear that um, Louisiana, the engine is is obviously the tip of the spear at this point. That's that's their big win. But they they have had other successful um, wins, like like the EDA Tech Hub uh, program. It's a it's an EDA Tech Hub headquarters. Uh, we'll move on uh, to Kentucky. And once I get through the five states, we'll come back and talk about some of these findings in more detail. So Kentucky, not an engines winner, but a very, very successful um, winner of other types of programs. So it's uh, it's it's a tech hub. Um, they're heavy participants in an i program. They have a reach hub. So lots of federal wins, large amounts of, of uh, cash uh, from the federal government coming into the state. Um, their state funding programs are wide ranging. So they uh, this is a, sm a sample of what they have, the Kentucky Commercialization Ventures, their seed stage and A stage investment fund called Keyhorse, Launch Blue, which is a University of Kentucky initiative that actually services more than just the University of Kentucky. So it, it works with startups at UK as well as um, in the state uh, to support those state initiatives. Uh, the Metals Innovation Initiative, which is a state funded program for the metals industry, and a few others. So their state uh, is is been a heavy investor in economic development activities, uh, and you see that at the state level with Keyhorse and KCV, as well as at the institutional level with with Launch Blue and, and Louisville has um, a, a similar program in healthcare. Uh, key research partners again, citing the college, the community college system, Louisville, Kentucky, other um, major institutions in the state. So starting again at the investment horizon. Um, Almost everyone you talk to in the state who's involved in this, any of these processes cites the Kentucky Innovation Act of 2002 as, as the turning point, which was led by the, the governor of Kentucky at the time, um, which started with, with $50 million in innovation investments, has gone much uh, bigger since then. Um, but that was the turning point, starting out with the realization that Kentucky lags its neighbors, both its contiguous neighbors and its not so far away neighbors, in uh, both innovation uh, as, as well as investment opportunities. So they were, ev even until not that long ago, 44th in total venture funding um, uh, available in the state. So they recognized they were well behind the capital needed uh, and the innovation um, programs needed to launch the state forward. And so they passed the Kentucky Innovation Act, which established different funds and different organizations, including what would be eventually Keyhorse Capital, KCV, and others, uh, to really create the state infrastructure around managing the math. And so this is a, another theme that we'll, we'll come back to several times. Um, this is somebody who's 
up until recently served on the Kentucky cabinet for economic development is actually now going to another state to, to um, build a similar program in that state. Uh, but she said, focus is key. Not every industry can be successful in the state. So they were careful about which, um, which uh, actual industries they they focus their efforts on. Very similar to Andy's comment around um, the Redwoods, that we, we could try to boost every industry. However, that's going to be too much uh, peanut buttering, as it's often called, uh, spreading the money around to lots of industries at a time when we need to pick the three or four problems we know we can solve and solve in a big way. Uh, and so, and that's what they did. They were pretty careful about choosing a handful of industries that Kentucky had could have leadership in, like metals, um, uh, like distilling, a major initiative in distilling, uh, and a few other uh, industries. So one example is uh, the Estate Whiskey Alliance. This is something that uh, Launch Blue has now uh, worked on with its distilleries uh, and in the supply chain for those distilleries, which uh, has created a certification program on sustainability, uh, which is something they uh, have gotten fair amount of funding for and is going to make an even more unique aspect, uh, really leaning into that industry uh, in the state in a way that the, the government, the universities, and the companies can actually work together towards building up uh, the next stage of, of the distilleries. To give you a little background on Keyhorse Capital, a lot of states have now found ways to set up direct funding programs. Um, many states, Kentucky has an anti-donation clause. Uh, the state government itself cannot just go out and, and give money, of course, uh, so they have to set up a, a mechanism by which uh, an outside organization is established. Uh, in this case, it's Keyhorse Capital. Keyhorse Capital then reports up to um, other uh, KCV within the state who then has uh, oversight of what Keyhorse might be doing, but Keyhorse is operating um, independently with, with capital available. So this is a fund that was intended to solve the ranked 44th uh, in the U.S. of, of capital uh, spending. And uh, their portfolio is a fairly um, uh, uh, fairly concentrated. So about 40% turn out to be about software companies. About 40% of their investments turn out uh, to be about life science and biotech companies. Uh, and the remainder 20% is you know different types of opportunities that, that do come up in the state. But uh, they have seen these uh, as strengths in their university system, especially in the uh, life sciences and biotech uh, era. Uh, you know, Louisville is a large health uh, complex. Uh, and so that's an area where they can be investing heavily. But a big part of what these initiatives do is not just cause capital in the state, but actually take a more active role in cultivating the next generation of venture investors. So that is a long-term, you know, talking about the event horizon, uh, investment horizon, that is a long-term aspect of this entire um, of this entire investment uh, where we're starting to think about how do we uh, create value when Keyhorse Capital is gone and the state is no longer necessarily needed to invest in people, it means we have to have future seed and, and series A and B investors. So they have a whole active program to actually train uh, investors to move into tech markets uh, and and then learn about investing in tech markets, expectations, processes, et cetera. Speaking of having a long-term commitment, uh, Keyhorse Capital is coming to its end of funding life. So it wasn't intended, uh, it had been an evergreen fund, but it's not intended that this is gonna go on for the rest of, of time. Uh, they are coming to the end of the fund. And the very interesting point is they have enough returned in their account now to continue to invest for several years. So. In many ways, Keyhorse Capital, although it was primed by state initiatives, is continuing to operate because out, operating outside of the state just with state resources has enabled it to do what a venture capital fund should do, which is create enough return on investment that the fund itself can continue to, to reinvest. You know, They don't have LPs in, in, in the way that a traditional fund would have to just hand the returns back to. The returns actually go back to the state by enabling Keyhorse to invest in more companies and have more technology uh, startups uh, get formed across the state, really bridging that gap until a Series B investment um, uh, can occur. This is all going to a comment that um, we received from uh, Ian McClure, who is the head of Launch Blue and uh, the PI on, on several large initiatives uh, within um, 
within Kentucky, that having the state provide key resources is essential for federal programs. It's very difficult for a land grant university to launch innovation startup programs. He was specifically talking about, um, when we talked to him, they had uh, just won uh, their uh, a big EDA Tech Hub uh, award. And um, we asked him, what were the key features uh, that helped you be one of the centers winning this award? And he cited Key Horse Ventures as the top feature uh, that, that enabled them to have the award. So Keyhorse actually um, put up cash uh, and said, this is coming out of our investment fund, but we can uh, do a match with um, the resources the federal government will provide for the tech hub. So uh, Ian's point was, if you don't have uh, direct funding available in cash, that makes it riskier, of course, for a federal agency to to want to go down that route. And so Keyhorse was was the lead on that to be able to provide some matching um, capital uh, for the EDA Tech Hub. I'm going to shift gears for a second to South Carolina. Uh, so South Carolina is a much more mature economy on on a lot of these. Um, they also have been um, successful recipients from. Uh, various award programs. I, I've highlighted just a few here. Uh, you know, BMW um, opened uh, their North American headquarters and a lot of manufacturing there. Um, it's long been the home of Michigan's North, North American headquarters. A lot of the supply chain in the auto industry has shifted as a result of, of those, um, those headquarters. But they are also still successful in the NSF engines program and, and getting EDA money and, and other um, opportunities. Like Kentucky, they have a, a very robust um, tech-based economic development set of initiatives within the South Carolina government. Um, the South Carolina Research Alliance, SC Commerce, SC Commerce set up something called the SC Fraunhofer Alliance, which is what it sounds like. It's an alliance between the Fraunhofer, Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany with um, the universities in Kentucky to do joint research between Fraunhofer, Kentucky, I'm sorry, South Carolina universities and companies who are looking to solve real innovation problems in the state. And that alliance uh, operates such that the state of South Carolina will, will match research funding. Uh, and one of their biggest um, users of that opportunity is, is, is BMW. So BMW may do a project with Clemson to solve a, a true technical challenge which is a great research opportunity for the Clemson um, faculty and, and students. It's something that BMW needs solved um, and uh, money comes in from, from multiple parties, but South, South Carolina itself is actually putting up some matching funds um, to do the research as well. So the concept being it, it creates a win for everyone who's, who's located in that state. They also recently launched Invest SC, which is a $50 million fund, a lot like Keyhorse, uh, which, is, which is trying to do um, uh, seed investments. Uh, not surprisingly, you know, uh, key research partners include the university system. Uh, not, not everyone is listed here, but major ones, Clemson, Musk, University of South Carolina. Uh, they do have the Savannah River National Lab, Nuclear Energy Lab, and then a robust community college system. So this is where economic gardening comes into play. Uh, this interesting quote I heard from multiple people interviewed at different times in this project, it's like planting a tree. Um, now the state flag of South Carolina has a, a palmetto tree on it. So I, I wonder if that's causing this, but it's clearly a, a, a sentence that people say uh, in, in that state who um, are thinking about economic development as a long-term uh, project. We have to invest, we have to garden today and we will reap the benefits of that um, tomorrow. So an interesting comparison um, from, from some of the folks we spoke with and, and, and a lot of the research we did is South Carolina and Mississippi kind of in, in 1990 or so were, were roughly similar demographically, uh, population, the amount of economic activity, growth rate, et cetera. Um, and both started investing in uh, economic development activities. Uh, and today the, the economy in Mississippi is very different than the economy of South Carolina. And um, what, why is that? And so the folks in South Carolina were, were pretty interesting. They cited early on, uh, you know, back in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, Pennsylvania, Texas, Ohio as, you know, aggressive states who had put together fairly robust economic development program, technology-based economic development programs. And South Carolina didn't say, we need to think about just being better than certain states that look like us, like, like Mississippi. They said, what are the most aggressive, most um, 
mature program states doing and how do we think about uh, adopting those programs in ways that are meaningful for us so we can't do exactly what pittsburgh pennsylvania did with the ben franklin funds but we can do something of that magnitude and think about what what they've learned from it so uh starting in in kind of you know in the late 90s early 2000s uh so again kind of going back 15 20 22 years uh south carolina starts putting in major programs uh, and today, uh, those programs are now um, are paying off. One of the key things, uh, two key things that they did early on was build a lot of state infrastructure. Uh, they, are, they were wedged between you know Georgia and North Carolina, whose economies were much stronger. Uh, so by infrastructure, you know roads and, and bridges included, uh, but as well as uh, major education programs to make the state uh, uh, successful for any company that is there. So. BMW was uh, easier for a BMW to move if there's a great education system for people to transfer to, families to move uh, and, and feel comfortable with their with the kids going to school. So they began really heavily investing in education uh, up and down K, K through 12 and of course their, their university system, as well as um, building true infrastructure uh, that, that would be supported um, it being wedged between Georgia and, and North Carolina. Um, then communication wise, uh, another theme we, we heard and I've mentioned already is there is a monthly meeting uh, between SC Commerce and uh, several of the university partners, uh, really uh, not always with a strict agenda that we have to apply for this engines award or we have to apply for this EDA grant, just a meeting to ask what are we doing next. Um, so even after even after these kind of major wins they've had, they continue to, to look forward into the next um, the next phase. And that, I'll say this again multiple times today, that a monthly meeting between the state economic development agencies, the universities, and in some cases, corporate partners, although not necessarily in all cases, is uh, the table stakes uh, for a lot of these programs, that we can't come to a proposal that's high, that shows how, com how coordinated we are if we haven't been talking about this for 18 months already. And uh, uh, Julie Conkler, who's the... Um, uh, person in charge of, of this at SE Commerce uh, made the point, I think I talked to her at nine o'clock in the morning uh, and she said, you know, I've already had two meetings today, just today, one with Fraunhofer and one with a, a local university uh, to talk about what is our next program initiative we're going to work on for 2025. So that like constant communication, it, it doesn't require a state budget to get passed, but it does require um, an organization to lead. And thinking about the past couple of states we've, we've covered in Louisiana, LSU took the lead on the engines award. Um, in Kentucky, uh, Keyhorse Capital actually took the lead on um, the, e the EDA tech hub. And in this case, SC Commerce took the lead um, on uh, their, their tech hub that they, they were just awarded. So an organization has to take the lead. It can be the state economic development agency, it can be the university, but one leader has to be the coordinator of, of every party to ensure that we're not competing with, with each other. Um, a last point that, that sort of came out in several of the conversations and, and, and some of the data analysis in South Carolina was uh, tax credits for direct investment uh, in R&D have done little. We heard this again and again also in Louisiana, uh, that tax credits uh, to try to force R&D initiatives, to force PhD hiring, to force um, startups to, to occur, uh, will provide credits and may cause a little bit of action, but repeatedly were found to be um, subpar and, and never lived up to the expectations of either hiring or growth um, or, or even relocation. Um, I, I say all that because we'll see a, a, a graphic in a second about where tax credits are spread in, uh, in each of these states. And it's going to be an important initiative. So recall that, that uh, the states we've already talked about very much found tax credits to be uh, a, a tried effort that that didn't always work out um, for their state and, and, and rarely was as good as putting true teeth into something, whether it's the $67 million uh, line item, single line item in uh, Louisiana's um, application, the, the $50 million in key horse capital that then could lead to a, a match or, or, or otherwise. Okay, let's go to Ohio. So Ohio, not, not an F-score state, but uh, a state that has gone through a major, major transition along with other Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Indiana, where um, when they saw industry leaving, they said, we need to 
to think about how economic development in our state will help us transform our economy in a, in a positive growth way. And Ohio has a lot of success stories today to talk about. I, I referenced earlier, but the Intel fab um, uh, going to Columbus, Ohio is obviously a multi-billion dollar win um, for the state. And again, all of that is 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 something due to you know economic gardening that started a long time ago. Um, so Ohio, you know, has um, one of the NCIA centers, which is an older version of the uh, NIH sort of reach program. So Cleveland Clinic uh, has an NCAA center, uh, NCAI center. Um, they they were a participant in the Illinois led uh, water uh, NSF engine. Um, they obviously have EDA Tech Hub, uh, HQ, uh, et cetera. So the, Re really robust, you know, winnings, uh, so to speak. There's they have many state funding programs, but the two that most people probably on this call are familiar with are the Edison Seed Fund, which eventually was replaced largely by the Third Frontier, um, which is their uh, uh, was funded by two billion, a couple billion dollars in in, in bonds and other other initiatives, uh, and uh, was a massive aggressive program across the state that has now spawned other um, state led programs as as well. Obviously, Ohio has a very robust uh, research system. So Ohio State and Cincinnati, um, lots of health systems around the state, Case Western, uh, also a robust um, uh, a, a robust community college system. They have Air Force uh, labs there. So lots of research to build on uh, in, in that state. So again, starting uh, with the investment horizon, state-led programs led started years ago. So the original Edison program um, decades ago, literally, uh, and um, you know, Third Frontier and all these other programs, if, if you speak to people in the state, they cite you know 20 years ago, early 2000s, when we started making lots of investments in economic development activities. And as we start to um, started to build up uh, the impact of those investments, the last decade, we've seen we've seen the trees growing. Um, we've seen lots of these new programs come to our state, but again, the the time it took um, was longer. Um, Third Frontier, interestingly, is is winding down. It's again like can't fund it forever. Um, however, uh, they do believe they can now continue to invest like Keyhorse from their ROI account. So a big part of Third Frontier is making direct investments in tech companies. The tech companies have done well, uh, at least enough of them have done well, that they now can extend the life just like a, an investment fund could um, and, and, cont and continue to, to invest. So it's sort of another example of these investment funds have actually looked pretty good uh, when, the, when the state has, has gotten them funded. Um, one of the key uh, insights from, from really any, anyone you talk to in the state um, is that Third Frontier and other related programs they have was very careful to focus on you know intra Ohio regions, meaning the Toledo region, the Columbus region, Dayton, Cincinnati, Cleveland, as their own micro areas where they could enforce collaboration as part of the program or incent collaboration as part of the program. For which uh, the, that mini region can then think about what is our economic assets, what are our redwoods in in this region. So coordination and industry focus were then cited as, as really critical elements. Um, uh, one, one interesting comment was uh, they're considering moving um, the uh, front, third frontier funding into a state line item. Uh, and they, they're still actually, uh, I think, being considered. Um, and, and this person noted that when Edison was a line item, we were spreading uh, uh, money around the state because the, then the state legislature is voting on it. Uh, and, and each legislative uh, member wants to vote on how do we get some of this third frontier money into my neck of the woods, um, which is this peanut buttering concept. But the current process for a lot of the programs is, is very competitive. So if you want to get some funding, you have to meet a number of different um, criteria. And sometimes they say no to a, an interstate region. Um, they require that they have um, a, a su supporting investment organization. So we won't just give you money. You have to go provide money somehow, whether it's um, investors who are going to match some of the state funding or you have some other mechanism from foundations, for example. Um, and the result is uh, this competition uh, uh, really creates or forces the, the, the little cluster, the state cluster to think about what is it that makes Toledo different than other places that we can really narrowly focus on. What is it about the specific technologies or specific opportunities we have in this one area 
given our partners in this area, whether it's, you know, in, in Toledo's case, University of Toledo, Mercy Boncourt has a, a, a large hospital system there, et cetera. Uh, how do we partner together in something that we can collaborate on that, that's specific to our, our, our initiative? Um, another aspect that is similar across all states, but I'll just highlight it in, in Ohio, is that the state government, R1 universities, and community colleges very much are aligned in part, again, because of a constant communication tenure. And now in Ohio, um, a lot of this communication happens at that like metro area. Uh, more more often than not, largely because its population is a bit larger, they have high concentrations in those areas, and those areas do have um, different competitive assets. But the idea being that community colleges are able to train strong workforces, the R1 universities are able to establish uh, really good technology opportunities, and they have to be working together on a state program, uh, which is in fact how a lot of the state funding uh, does, does work in, in Ohio. They, they want those organizations working together. Um, lastly, we'll we'll go to North Dakota. So North Dakota is interesting. That is a state that has not um, historically had major major um, investment in in economic development, but they are very much an up and coming state. Uh, they won an engine. They they led and won an engine. They are an I Corps regional hub, and so North Dakota is one to watch. They have been doing the things uh, more recently that they need to do. Um, uh, I don't think anyone would say if you go back to 15 to 20 years, like South Carolina or Ohio or Kentucky, that North Dakota suddenly had opened up a new initiative and, and started its own state sponsored um, fund and anything else like that. So they are a, a good model to think about um, what can we be doing uh, today to, to cause more activity. Um, so one of the interesting things about North Dakota was that it's only one of five states that um, didn't receive either part of the EDA Tech Hub program. Uh, New Mexico is is one of them, Iowa, Nebraska, and, and Hawaii. Um, and, and so you know, Tech Hub is obviously a big, vast program. And so I think that is something that North Dakota and New Mexico can, can be working for um, in the future. Um, and they haven't otherwise been the lead on other large-scale grants. So it's an interesting analogy because they were able to do the things they needed to do to get the NSF engine award. Uh, and, and so in spite of maybe not having this long tradition of, um, of investment. So things they have been doing, um, they have gotten direct appropriation to launch the technology loan fund. Uh, so it, what it sounds like uh, to support the commercialization of, of technology within institutions at, at North Dakota, um, you know, not a tax credit, but a direct um, uh, loan opportunity. And that opportunity is actually based on being able to leverage other other funds coming into the organization. Um, and so that is, you know, a great example of where the government um, has started something that demonstrates to a future funder or a future company who's um, thinking about uh, investing that the state is willing to put real money behind um, these initiatives. Another key uh, to their success has, has also been um, uh, really aligning the region. So we heard this as well as we spoke to the, the PI on, on the awards application that the conversations had started long before uh, the NSF engine was coming out. Um, they had already been working together first on i and, and other initiatives uh, that created a communication pattern where um, uh, North Dakota State was by the, by de facto the, the leader and convener of conversations across different organizations and over time could coalesce into a really aligned uh, set of organizations on one application in the state um, that could solve a problem that they they felt they were uniquely able to solve. And so, again, something we can sort of do for no state budget allocation is, is meet and convene uh, and uh, really uh, get to an agreement on, on leadership on the problem that we're going to solve. What are the redwoods that we're going to talk about in this state? Okay, so that was obviously a, an overview of a, a lot of interviews and a lot of data uh, to just give you some state uh, profiles. Let me turn to kind of emphasizing what we would see as the sort of five themes that came out of this and talk about those. Obviously, I've already mentioned several aspects of these. Uh, I, I want to reiterate the, the idea of credible direct state investment. And 
I've inserted the word credible here based on the work that, you know, of, of interviewing and looking at data, because that is sort of the word that is underneath the sentence for anyone you talk to who's who's been successful in these large programs, that it has to be a way to show uh, the funder that that money is really going to be there. And many of you know that um, we there's been some issues now in, in, in the NSF um, engines program that some states may not have had... Um, enough funding or may not have had the credible direct state investment or state funding available. And so that's going to be tested even harder this coming round. Um, the second is, again, I'm going to use the word credible, is a credible focus on distinct research priorities. And by credible, this is what, this is not, we want to solve an energy issue that our state might be involved in. It's we are going to uh, uh, solve an issue, energy or otherwise, that our state can can be the leader in and has universal appeal. And so the engines programs, even a lot of the tech hubs uh, proposals uh, are successful when they have this aspect to them, which is what are the distinct research priorities that only New Mexico uh, can really solve and will have um, global uh, global re or I'm sorry country wide wide reach. I should say one more thing. One of the challenges, especially talking to other uh, potential proposals that will probably go in uh, in the coming months, is you're starting to see a lot of overlap on, I'll say, wor general word usage uh, on programs. So energy is one you, you, you're you hearing a lot of people uh, putting in proposals on energy, uh, not distinct enough for that specific um, region uh, to um, really distinguish itself either from the prior energy award uh, or uh, from other uh, applications that are gonna come in. So that's why I really am emphasizing the more detail on like the specific credible focus, uh, whether it's energy, whether it's water, whether it's something else, uh, it has, has gotta be part of this. Um, the next one is something I, I've, I have highlighted a few times, but the idea of coordinating early on what this application is gonna be out and not competing within the state. Um, I, Without naming names, uh, I've definitely heard from states who have who have already started to have multiple applications coming through and have gotten some guidance that, hey, um, you need to have more coordination here. The guidance isn't coming necessarily from the NSF. Um, it's coming from uh, corporate and institutional partners who are concerned about their state having multiple applications um, that that might show competition. So getting coordination with whatever region is defined is is clearly critical. And in any of the engines awards you spoke with had some flavor of, um, we knew we figured out what our region is, even if the region's really just the state borders very quickly so that we could then narrow down who were the real players that were going to involve in this process. Fourth theme, uh, which again, to reiterate, is this regular and deliberate communication. Uh, the best thing to come out of um, this conversation today is is a, a Google calendar invite or a calendar invite that goes out to everybody uh, who's involved in the next engine uh, that the, the you know, first and third Tuesdays, we're gonna get together for the next couple months and we're gonna talk through this uh, together. That, that simple process seems to be highly correlated um, with lots of wins as we saw. And we had, you know, multiple people say um, we were already coordinating for some other reason when another program happened to come out. And so we were able to then assemble the same people to go after the other program, which is why in a given state, you typically see awards given to a, a cluster of institutions working together. Um, a, a realistic goal, uh, fact, is the TBED, the tech-based economic development investment horizon is five to 15 years. Um, I often talk about, uh, uh, or years ago talked about um, uh, uh, the San Diego biotech industry. So I, I used to live in the Bay Area and people would talk about how the biotech industry there was an overnight success, except that Qualcomm and other, um, not Qualcomm, but other some of the biotech companies had, had been formed 20 years earlier and just were nascent companies. And so kind of a similar analogy here that um, it's easy to look at big recent successes, but most of these investments have started a decade or more ago. Um, and it, it, But that's okay. If we don't have that investment in place, it's important to think about planting the tree now um, for the next 10 years. And there's other things we can be doing. North Dakota is, is a great example uh, to really improve our chances in the very, very short run. Um, but it just means that if we haven't built all the infrastructure in place, we probably need to be very aggressive about it if we're serious about 
going after some of these major federal programs. Uh, so we have to maybe double down uh, bigger than than uh, we might have otherwise been comfortable doing. And we have to push harder on other levers, whether it's coordinating, whether it's being uh, much more narrow about our research priority that we're going to focus on for, for a particular um, program. Um, but that that is the realistic point that needs to be understood at the institutional level, at the state level, uh, the, the, the TBED horizon to, to actually pay off is, is quite long. So I want to shift now to some of the data uh, and um, talk through some of these these items. Uh, this is um, a, a listing of uh, every uh, uh, tech-based economic development program um, in, in every state. We have this for every state, coded it for every state, and separated out programs that were specific to a particular industry. So there's lots of programs that are very general in nature. So we give a tax credit for new businesses growing at a particular rate. It doesn't matter what industry this business is in. That's not what we're talking about here. Almost every state has something similar to that where it's a very general program. These are cases where a specific industry is named in the, the charter or the, the application process for that particular um, funding initiative or tax credit initiative. So this includes direct funding. It includes um, loan forgiveness or loan supplements, includes tax credits, et cetera. And uh, you can probably see why this graph is on the screen, that if you look at New Mexico's programs, they are wide ranging across very specific things. So uh, there is an ag um, uh, investment program, there is uh, a dairy investment program, there is a high tech investment program, uh, investor uh, supplement program, software, et cetera. And that term we hear in, often in economic development of peanut buttering the initiatives, meaning we're trying to spread cash or spread credits to lots of programs to let them all rise has you know, repeatedly shown um, not the strongest way to, to really cause anything to happen for several reasons. One is that um, no one, sometimes no one industry then has enough resources made available to it to actually um, cause a transformational change that, that you're looking for. Another aspect of that, which I think is the deeper initiative that I've I've seen in uh, not just New Mexico, but many other states, um, is that that means the state doesn't quite have a focused understanding of where we really can build our resource relationships. Um, so we're still just treating economic development as just a thing we do, but we aren't strategically thinking about how do we craft our decision-making process around this is what's good for this initiative, for this particular state, and being able to communicate and message that to other stakeholders. One of the key discussions, um, uh, discussion points that we heard repeatedly in this process was the importance of having focused communications. Um, in, in South Carolina and Kentucky, other places we heard over and over again, the aspect of we have to communicate to uh, the electorate, to um, local officials, to companies that aren't in our kind of focal industries that why we are in investing in only some industries and not all industries. And it's it's very much around having, we have a strategy that these four or five markets are key for our economy. It's not that we don't want to support other markets, other industries, but that we need, we need to actually uh, invest heavily in these things that we have a competitive advantage in. And that communication process is, is, is just as important um, as anything else. And if you don't have a strategy for exactly what those industries are, it's almost impossible to communicate that logic. Um, the other thing you'll, you'll kind of take away is there's a couple of mar areas like entertainment. These are typically like film tax credits uh, that um, I, I live here in Chicago that we, we also uh, provide. Uh, that you know, a few there's a few industries where sort of everyone has has something involved. So every most every state has something to support uh, tech startups and their and potentially investors involved. So it's not saying that we shouldn't have those industries supported. Um, it's saying that like the number of industries being supported, it, it might be bigger than we really like. The other aspect of of this looking at the technology-based economic development programs and how they are actually executed is the idea of funding support versus tax credits. So funding support would be any program where there's either direct um, or indirect um, capital or um, some type of loan relationship where um, it enforces low interest loans or provides the capital to back low interest loans, for example. Um, 
versus uh, purely tax credits, where if you perform an action, you get a, a credit um, on your income tax. So what's interesting is just pure count. So um, we don't have the exact, it's almost impossible to get the exact amount of um, rev uh, revenue or resources behind both of these because tax credits are sort of a, a theoretical possibility that that could occur in the future. Funding support, certainly you could, um, but it's hard to kind of measure these on a, on a revenue basis. So we can only do it by count of program basis. But I, I think it's still indicative of, of what you, um, of, of uh, the program shift a bit. So, and I have Ian McClure's um, point up there that having the state provide key kind of financial resources was essential for them getting um, federal government uh, programs. And so the numbers I think, you know, may speak for themselves a bit that uh, the five profile states, also most other states, if you look at them, um, the majority of what they do is direct or indirect funding support of a particular set of initiatives. Um, what we found in New Mexico is only about a fifth of the number of programs available um, are, are, are really for funding support. So that direct funding that, that, that Kentucky so, said was critical for the EDA, critical for the NIH reach program, critical to be a participant in the I-Corps hub. Um, it, it doesn't feel like there's enough happening. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I, I think, I think that's something a lot of folks have, we would talk to, to others in New Mexico, pe people are aware of. Okay. The next uh, slide is uh, several parts of data put together across many data sources. So let me take just a moment to explain what this is. So on the left is the amount of tech-based economic development spending per business establishment um, in the state. And we've broken that into um, F-score and non-F-score. Uh, the, the horizontal axis, the x-axis, is the count of states across the U.S. that fall into this. So um, there are 10 states uh, with programs that spend more than $1,500 um, and are upscore states, uh, for example, uh, in, in the U.S., uh, $1,500 per, per business establishment when it comes to economic development spending. So this is really interesting because first, um, if you stare at it hard enough, you know, it, it looks like about the same distribution of spend per business uh, between F score and non F score, and and we like the spend per business because it's a way to normalize um, large states with wealthy po deep pockets and and states that don't have deep pockets because um, it, it's roughly approximating like how much you should be able to spend based on your state budgeting process. Obviously, some states collect a lot more tax and other money than others, uh, but it's trying to get at that approximation of just for the businesses that you have in your state. How aggressive are you in spending on those businesses? So, uh, and so, you know, F score is at the the main level. At, you know, F score and non F score states roughly um, equal the the same count. So it's it's roughly the same distribution. Um, non F score states tend to spend you know a little bit less on uh, more non F score states um, spend spend um, smaller amounts at the bottom end. The reason I tell you all this is because I want to walk through kind of where the states are that we looked at. So it may not surprise everybody that New Mexico is in the lowest tier of economic development spending, um, uh, along with um, really just three other uh, F-score states. Uh, North Dakota happens to be one. So again, that's a, a really interesting comparison of a, a later um, entrant into the economic development game, still great opportunities, um, but we need to press on other initiatives. The case studies, uh, and we didn't select the case studies having this um, chart uh, memorized, you know, before we started, but interesting to note that the case, it, one factor was economic development spending, but not, not the only one. And we found that the case studies, you know, organ states that have been highly successful in, in drawing in programs, Ohio, Kentucky, Louisiana, South Carolina, are spending above average um, in the U.S. on their, on, on their economic development, even after normalizing it for the number of businesses. And a place like Ohio, which has many, many businesses, I mean, that's a massive amount of spending. It's, it's uh, going through, you know, with things like the third frontier. So we, we thought that was sort of an interesting um, comparison that um, we're not just a little behind right now. We have a long way to go um, if we want to use economic development as a lever um, on direct funding. We then pulled comparable states. So uh, if you remember back at the beginning of this presentation, I had a long chart of um, the top, I think it was about 25 states in the in the final score of how we rated them. 
Uh, and that final score, um, you know, basically uh, showed where New Mexico was about equivalent to a couple of you know, Louisiana um, and um, South Carolina at the top. Uh, we then just pulled other states off that chart that were close by uh, and then just we didn't happen to do case studies on. And we found that, you know, Alabama, Kansas, Wyoming, Arkansas, Idaho, Nebraska also heavy, very aggressive in their spend um, on economic development. So they are. You know, this obviously includes EPSCOR states here. Uh, they are um, heavy spending um, when you're trying to to, um, to to boost the economy. Oklahoma looked a lot more like um, New Mexico and North Dakota, but I think you know the obvious uh, separation there is, is pretty clear. I say this all because uh, uh, you know I used to be a, a professor, an economics professor, uh, and studied economic development and innovation. And so um, I, I would love to show you a giant regression that is proof point. Uh, we don't have enough data to run the regression, but I'll show you a basic statistic. That basic statistic is 39% of the states in the top half of um, our, our sample won an NSF engine and um, uh, about 30%, uh, about, uh, a little under 31% of states um, uh, have uh, uh, in the lower half to spend one an engine. So, you know, how I might interpret this, uh, again, it's not, we don't have a great, uh, causality. It's not a perfect regression model, it, but the states in that top half have a better way to have a credible mechanism that they are de-risked that application for the NSF or the EDA or the NIH or whatever program we're talking about. Um, they've de-risked it. They have credible state investment. And um, if they are spending at that level, I, I think places like Ohio and South Carolina have shown when you're spending a lot of money like this um, at the state level, you are forcing communications and you're better to, able to coordinate on what those in, in investment initiatives are and, and probably better able to put together a good a good proposal for whatever federal program you're trying to go after. So uh, pretty interesting, um, pretty interesting uh, outcome to me. OK, so we talked about regular and deliberate communications. I want to kind of conclude the last few slides so I can leave um, some time for to discussion. Um, but, you know, convening by either university or state leader uh, is is critical. Uh, we found almost everyone we talked to made this point that that it, it, it sort of matters who it is based on what the exact initiative is. Certain cases, um, like like uh, uh, Keyhorse needed to be the leader on the EDA Tech Hub for Kentucky. Um, North Dakota State needed to be the leader on the NSF engine, but having that that leader um, is critical um, to coordinate these stakeholders. Recognize that this is a kind of twelve to eighteen month process of meetings. Um, and the nice thing that came out of all this is several states talked about, we, we were meeting, you know, monthly and we realized that we started doing a lot of the work of whatever that initiative was going to be just by working in the room, working through problems, starting to set up some resources in our institutions and companies. And so we were kind of doing the interesting part of the getting the grant started, even though we didn't even know we were going to win the award. And multiple people said, we we literally said to our partners in the room, we should just do this in some way, even if we don't get a tech hub or an engine or whatever. So they recognized that once they, they had gotten really good product market fit, they had figured out what is our exact um, uh, uh, mechanism by which we're going to go after this grant, what's our problem solution set that we're going to provide. If we don't get this award, we, we, should, we should find a way to continue on, uh, maybe at a smaller scale. Last um, aspect of this entire project was the role of corporate partners, which was really interesting. Um, we, we, spoke to, we spoke to universities, we spoke to government agencies, we spoke to companies uh, in all aspects of this. Um, and so we've, we've kind of broken, um, broken this, this, talk, uh, this talk track into the two perspectives. So sort of the university uh, perspective, which aligned a lot with the state perspective, um, ranged from several people saying, you know, the corporate partners are on these initiatives. They, everyone will sign a, um, a letter of support that doesn't cost the corporate partner anything. Uh, and um, it's just to be a good citizen. Um, but that means that they may show up at the meetings, but we don't know if they're really committed yet. Um, they're just supporting us. We'll come back to that in the corporate uh, point of view in a second. Um, one of the people at LSU and and actually um, some of the folks in Tulane we spoke to had the, kind of the same comment that like 
these corporate partners were not assembled for the purpose of applying for an EDA grant or applying for an engines grant necessarily. They were people that they already had deeper relationships with at an institutional level. It might, might not be between the person leading the initiative at that particular institution, but certainly in this case, the energy companies um, had already been working with LSU, hiring their engineer engineering grads for years, uh, doing collaborative research, et cetera. So that was already happening. Um, and these relationships enabled that existed enabled them to deepen them um, quite a bit. Um, one of the uh, interview folks we we uh, spoke to said something that we've all sort of heard if you've applied for a grant before. Um, but he this person is both a, a, one of the investigators on NSF Engine, but also has pre uh, previously been an engineering research center um, a proposal reviewer for for a number of years at the NSF. And his, his point was the process of, or practice of like fitting a story to what you think the NSF or the NIH or anyone else wants to hear is, is always a losing strategy because they can see right through um, whether you have real corporate partners who are gonna step up, uh, a, credible, um, uh, a credible way to work with these corporate partners to solve a problem that they can actually solve and would want to. So he was, he was really um, clear about the word authentic, uh, credible, um, really, they have to be corporate partners on these uh, applications that is something they would, would be interested in. You, you can't go to a consumer products company and hope they're going to solve a water crisis unless that company is involved in the beverage industry or something similar. Um, so the point here is, of course, corporate supporters are required for many programs. Um, it's not quite clear often early enough in the process whether the corporate partner is really going to be committed to, to participate in the program. So that that really was the university perspective. I think probably most people in this um, webinar have had the same experience or and are not surprised by this. So then we spoke to a number of companies, um, most of them were larger companies who are have been supportive of uh, various grants, whether it's an NSF initiative or an EDA initiative. We also did spoke, speak to a few smaller companies who do a lot of um, collaborative research and hiring at universities just to get their perspective to see how that changed. And there were a couple of aspects I'd say we we took away from some of the quotes. So one common one that we heard from multiple larger companies is that they are trying to see if it's real. Um, if if the state has not have, a, you know, back to kind of the Louisiana NSF engine, if the state does not have a line item budget approved already, is this program really going to happen? And companies, not surprisingly, de-risking their own time investments, um, don't want to hear that the state will pass something later on. They want to hear that this has been a high prioritized budget item. Uh, and if, if it's if it's not next year, then they, they're, again, not that interested. So not surprising, but it is definitely a characteristic that um, that was one of the first things that we heard from, from many of the major companies that we spoke with, that they really are trying to guess, guesstimate what is the timing and real support from the state government in this process. Um, the second thing that we heard really from large and small companies is the narrowness of the, of the, um, the problem that we're solving together really, really matters for our level of participation. Um, and I, I would not to give the companies away because I'm, I'm, you know, trying to keep this a bit balanced for their behalf, but, you know, the examples we had were within a very specific technology, uh, problem set, they got down to talking about if it's, if it's solution set A, and that's related to how we're doing R and D today, and rather than A prime, which is a little bit adjacent, we're we're only going to go with a program that's A, not A prime. Um, and and the se second second quote really talks about um, we're trying to find out who are the exact people that we would be partnering with, um, and are they going to solve this explicit problem that that we we think is is important. So that causes the selection of of companies uh, to be much more narrow than one might might expect. And I guess I'm I'm trying to lay out two levels of corporate partners now. The the engines specifically wants more corporate partners. There's no question about it. If we send in an application with three or four or five corporate partners, that that's going to be a desk rejection. Um, so they want to show see that yes, I have broad based support for industry in that's credible in my state. But in the implementation of these processes, who is it the, at the company who's really going to be more actively involved? Um, when we go forward. 
Uh, we, we also did speak to um, some folks who were actually involved in the NSF engines process, either, uh, you know, one, some that were actually, in fact, a uh, big part of the application process as a co-PI, others who are, were just active in the process. And this was uh, their sense as well, that they expected of the consortia of industry, we're trying to figure out who is really going to um, step up and do some work um, later on. And then, um, I, you know, I kept talking about the importance of, um, of uh, communication and um, I'm going to uh, point to this last quote uh, from, from one of the larger companies, um, but it was as a consistent um, message from, from a lot of people we spoke to that we don't have a lot of time to show up at planning meetings. So I keep saying it seems like you have to have monthly planning meetings or regular planning meetings. And this organization said, well, we can't just show up and brainstorm ideas. So we want to understand, like, how does this really relate to what we want to do? Um, we're not. We're, we're not necessarily ideating. We want to be involved early, but we don't want to be the ones um, necessarily who are going to endless meetings if, if there's not a clear initiative that, that's on the table. So it is very much striking a balance to make sure that the corporations are going to be involved, um, but that um, their uh, uh, participation has to be tempered with what their real, um, their real interest level is, how narrow is that problem set for them. Okay. Last pro tip, uh, last item uh, before a conversation is, is a little bit of a pro tip, which is we hear it repeatedly, but I'll, I'll, I have two kind of quotes here, is the importance of hiring dedicated communication staff. And I, I, I don't know, this may have already happened for other initiatives in, within New Mexico, but, but that was something that each state sort of talked about uh, that they brought in, uh, in Louisiana, they brought in a, um, a consulting firm to do communications. They're still actually doing a lot of work with them today. Um, to communicate to stakeholders in the state why we're doing this, to help brand the initiative. One of the key things of being a strong leader like LSU was it couldn't just look like it's LSU's program. It's a state program. It's a region program. So we have to continuously, during the application process and after the award, have to keep explaining that to people. And, uh, you know, somebody from, from Kentucky said, the most important hire I've ever made is the director of marketing for both what I do on a daily basis, but also to make sure that, again, the people who are impacted in our state with these programs understand why we're doing them uh, and um, that we have a system in place to demonstrate how we can succeed by, by going after these federal initiatives. Um, I will uh, stop there. And I know we've um, had a lot of um, questions come in. Uh, so let me go back to an open discussion. I'll, um, take my slides down, but I uh, can certainly jump back in, uh, to it. I think we've had a first question. Um, uh, let's see, Q and A one second. There we go. Uh, more of a comment. I think many times, uh, um, New Mexico tech and New Mexico state are left out of these initiatives and these collaboratives. Um, so I think, uh, Christina, if you want to uh, to address that. Sure. So I think um, the first state kind of from our analysis that jumps to mind with this comment is Ohio, because one of the strategic advantages that was cited with Ohio is the fact that there was a lot of coordination um, between the R1s and the community colleges. Um, and you know the state played a role in that, the cities played a role in that too. But the role of community colleges is actually one of the big things that attracted the intel to Ohio. And it's, it's one of the big, really compelling reasons why Ohio was, was picked over other locations that Intel could have gone to for um, their fab lab. And so with that, the other thing that I would point out is that many of the, the states um, that Rob presented about um, in those, those partnerships, you saw non-R1 academic institutions listed. And so I think that one of the things to consider is, is in New Mexico, what are those, those assets that New Mexico has? And, and some of those assets include other types of academic institutions. Um, on the other side of the coin, there's also the question of, of fit for the solicitation itself. Um, and this was something that, that Rob highlighted across many of the conversations that he had with, or across the conversation for many different states. Um, and 
it's the idea of how is how are the the assets that New Mexico is going to bring to the table are going to be a good fit for what the solicitation is looking for. Um, in other states, we see community colleges or, or technical colleges playing a large role in meeting some of the workforce needs um, or maybe bringing community-based knowledge to the table in order to support um, understanding, uh, having a better understanding of the very specific challenge that the, the hub or the engine is, is going to address. Um, all of that being said, the other thing that we we heard was, like I said, about having a good fit with that solicitation, but that you need to pick the partners, not just academic institutions, but also corporate partners and um, other things that actually, and, and defining your region in a way that actually makes sense for the solicitation. So putting another organization on the proposal just for the sake of having them named on the proposal isn't going to create a strategic advantage. You get a strategic advantage when you have partners on the proposal who are bringing something that makes sense to, to create a win condition so that your proposal is competitive and so that it, it will be funded. Um, Rob, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, that's really well said. I, I guess maybe two kind of observations. Not every institution in Louisiana was on that proposal um, for the exact reason that um, we just talked about. Uh, it, what's interesting is, is that at the end, at, they committed, um, after they won the award, they committed to still include those institutions, um, but that they just weren't aligned with the specific problem statement that, that um, LSU, Tulane, and others were trying to solve at that point. Um, and just to reflect, you know, uh, the example of Intel is absolutely perfect. Um, and uh, other cases, like I mentioned BMW in South Carolina, one of the major things that they talked about was we have to train work the workforce and the line and the uh, factory engineers um, for this. And that doesn't come from Clemson. It typically comes from uh, other organizations, the state community colleges, et cetera. So that, I think that's a spot on point about it, it's a holistic solution for in each institution to fit within that problem set. I noticed that Mariah had raised her hand and Mariah, are you, if you're still uh, on with us, I'm gonna unmute you so you can ask your question or make your comment. Go ahead, Mariah. Uh, is that you, Selena? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. No, um, I think that was a really great presentation. It, it touched on all the things that I think New Mexico has to take into consideration in order to be competitive. And one is um, more collaboration, um, getting state buy-in. Uh, so I know right now, and I'm just from talking to other people and from other institutions, I think New Mexico is right now in a competition mode. I think each institution is submitting uh, at least one or two um, proposals for the NSF engine. However, I think there's still opportunity for the uh, some of the institutions to work together. For example, I think one of the things that uh, has come up is quantum. And I know that I think in Colorado, they became a tech hub and one of our institutions was part of that. And what I saw is that actually New Mexico Tech is working on something that could be synergistic with that. And that's looking at quantum save data assurance. And I think that the two, maybe the institutions are kind of doing things in parallel instead of kind of intersecting. So I feel like if we don't, if the, the state doesn't get a, an, a grant, an NSF engines grant this time, we need to really talk about where the synergies are with some of the things that we're working on. So I think that was my, just my general comment mm -hmm. and what I learned from, from this talk. I, I just, if I could add on to that, you're not alone. So other states I <laughs> am well aware of are, this is the biggest challenge they face right now, arguably, is ensuring that they are not competing with each other in the process. Um, and um, I, I know in one state, uh, uh, one of the largest employers in that state has actually gone to the state government and asked the state government to broker that we just need to choose one proposal. We can't be in all three. So um, this is this is clearly a, a challenge for everyone to to deal with and and getting over the that 
aspect, I think, puts you way ahead of, of probably a lot of other applications. It's also worth mentioning um, that, and it's very late in the game, so I, I don't think that NSF's ask is is viable for, for most proposals, but NSF did send out an email um, listing all of the, the organizations that had put in pre-proposals. Um, and basically the email asks for people to look at that list and look at others who are doing similar things and try to consolidate their proposals. Um, that email only went out, I think, within the last week or so. And so it's, like I said, it, it's very late in the game and it might not be realistic um, to try to do that. Um, but NSF is asking uh, basically to for, for proposers to do exactly um, what Mariah was suggesting um, about looking at them, seeing where there are, are similarities and seeing if if proposals can be consolidated based on those similarities that you see, um, especially when you're talking about something, when you're talking about places where there's economic spillover or where the workforce is going to, where you're going to be drawing from a similar workforce or a similar area of impact. Um, the challenge comes when you're defining a region, if you define that region so large across multiple states, for example, then it may not be effective, but if you, too, if you define a region in too small of a way, um, and then there is an, basically an adjacent region that is doing the same thing, um, but there is significant economic spillover between those two regions, NSF is going to view it as, well, you kind of, you should have been working together. So I just want to jump in with with one sort sort of thing of, about that. The the timing is a big thing. I mean, it's it is clear as you as you mentioned with NSF is like it's, it's a huge problem to to say, oh, great, let's partner at the last second. Um uh and but but it's also the idea that you're talking about um providing the resources, um, you know, uh for support, you know, when the decisions are made, you know, for, for you know, the $67 million in Kentucky, you know. That was the, was that basically put into a a fund that that existed long before a competition even existed, or or did they even do that at the start of a when a competition was announced? It was during the middle. So during the middle of the application process in in Louisiana, they went and they asked for a hundred, um, and uh, the state passed uh, sixty seven. Uh, but it was in the middle of that proposal process. But you're absolutely right. Um, I, I was trying to kind of get that out at the beginning, like. We can't just go and say, hey, can we get $50 million right now? Like, it's just like a state legislature can't do that. Um, so we have to think carefully about how can the state like step up and be at least credible in the way that they're going to provide resources, um, which is which is part of it. Yeah. And and has it been, and what is, it, in the most case, for, for people to choose and say, you know, go for one proposal, has it, has it been uh, generally the state that, that has been, that has said, this is the area we are doing this one? Uh, no, it's generally been a lead, the lead institution um, for all of these. Um, the state, uh, I think, often don't want to broker. The, like this example I was about, uh, you know, kind of theoretically talking. Well, it's, it's real. I'm just not disclosing the names. Um, I mean, that's a case where the state is going to have to broker something because they can't just have three applications, they felt. Um, but it's the lead institution. Um, but in every case, they've, the lead institution has gone to the state and gotten the economic development agency on board and supporting the process. Um, and so they can lean on the state, hopefully, to say, like, we're, we're backing this application. Because unless you were the size of uh, you know, California, not many states have enough resources available to back, credibly back two applications anyway, uh, in the way that NSF wants it all de-risked um, to start. Yeah. Yeah, just back in the Build Back Better started, it was 13 from New Mexico, right? And I think the other the other component, the, the role that the state can play is in helping set the research priorities. Um, so that was one of the things that we heard from um, North Dakota, was that the state was involved in the discussions about, okay, what are our top, what are the top 
both industries and, and research priorities and how do we align those so that the state has a strategy around innovation and research and development and economic development that makes sense on the state level. And then after the state has those, those top research priorities that are set, how do we align the academic institutions um, and the companies that we're bringing into the state and other things kind of around this strategy? And that's where those, those repeated meetings that Rob was talking about come into play. Um, and, and with North Dakota in particular, they have, I think, two research priorities that are, are kind of their top two. And then um, in the interviews, they were talking about how the state is still kind of all the key players are still debating what is, quote unquote, the third um, leg to the stool. Uh, they feel like they have two that are really solid and, and they feel like they they want a third research priority that's that's really um, funded and, and gets the same attention as the other two. Um, but there are debates about kind of which key stakeholders are going to be the winners when when that third priority ultimately gets settled on. Um, and that's not to say that it's easy for a state to set those priorities because it it, it does mean picking picking winners to a certain extent. And that's not something that um, state governments tend to be super comfortable doing. Um, in the same breath, having a coordinated strategy was was something that created a competitive advantage for um, the different states that we that we interviewed in this process. Uh, just uh, I'll go if there's other questions to pop up, feel free um, to 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 the others. There is the one next one I have in my mind is, is when you're looking through, through this and I didn't um, or through the other institutions that were successful uh, or states, I should say. Um, is there any sense of oh well we well we went for it once and we went for it again and we went and we got it the third time or or that hey we won one and now if we win one we'll get we went the same area of the next one and win a second one that that sort of building on an area or not that's a it? really great question so let me start with like two distinct answers to this one is um there's definitely the case that states who've won an engine are about to apply for another engine. That is 100% happening. Um, everything I hear on the more inside track is like the likelihood that you're gonna get a second one is very low uh, if you already won one. Like the NSF doesn't wanna just throw all their money in the same state. So that's that's good. But I, I part of what you just said, Dave, like, yeah, they think, oh, we won one, surely, well, let's go get another one. That is just not gonna happen. However, the second part of that is, I think a subtle insight and kind of, what I was trying to get at with that map at the beginning is once you have the uh, strategy and the infrastructure to be coordinating, then you are operating in a world where, okay, we might get an engine and then we can, we might get a tech hub and we might get whatever the next program is going to be. And we have the infrastructure to do it. And that's where I think if you just go back sort of back to the BBB, pro the Build Back Better program, look forward. That's where you see like sort of clusters, like like I mentioned, up, upstate New York, they just seem to have the infrastructure in place to be effective in applying for these things. So I, I think that's an important aspect that if if the if, if New Mexico doesn't get an engine, the infrastructure can be in place for whatever the next program is going to be. And I think that's that's a positive aspect. And I, I should have said this sort of at the beginning, like this is a very positive, you're, you're in a good spot. Like being an F-score state, I think having national labs is going to be beneficial. It's a massive um, competitive resource. So there is a lot of really good things to have that that are happening here. Um, it just it's going to require this like extra coordination that is 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 required of everybody to to go after this process. Um, the last thing I, I kind of hinted this at the beginning, but I think it's relevant for your question is like having talked to a couple of other states and some consultants in those states. There are like just some programs that are so generic that it's it's really evident that they're copying I, I guess copying in finger quotes programs that have already won. And that's the kind of fitting thing that the, the gentleman from Tulane mentioned. Like, I definitely know of states have said like, oh, look, that's Louisiana's angle. We're going to take almost the same angle. And I can guarantee they're not going to win a dollar. Um, that NSF does not want to fund the same project again. Uh, we already have an award for that. Um, so I think that's an important thing to think about when you have problem statement. 
The other thing that I would mention is that um, when you talk to people who work for NSF, program officers, the directors of different directorates, um, the way that they talk about the engines program is not, it's not the engine is the end all be all. The idea is that just by NSF creating the engines program, they're going to incentivize the type of coordination and focus on a combination of regional economic development and place-based innovation, um, and that they're going to incentivize that in a way that even if a region doesn't get awarded an engines program, that they will have started and started to lay the foundation to be more competitive for other money. And whether that's other NSF money, other NIH money, other EDA money, it doesn't matter to NSF. What NSF is hoping is that the process of having this program in place and putting big dollars behind it to incentivize people to, to create this coordination is going to make regions that are more competitive for lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, would, I, I don't work for NSF, I've never worked for NSF, I can't speak on their behalf, but I've heard enough commentary to know that they are hoping that this program is about creating the networks and, and laying the foundation to create the success stories. Um, and so that, that states do move kind of from where New Mexico is having none of these big, big awards over to where we saw North Dakota is where they've, they've landed one and they're, they're starting to, to get their feet under them. And then over to where we saw the other states in the presentation where they've they're they've racked up a whole bunch of these and they're well positioned to be very competitive for whatever the next solicitation is that comes out, regardless of which um, which government agency is the one issuing the solicitation. Well, great. Um, thank you very much, guys. This has been a great, uh, a great proposal. I, I just realized we've gone <laughs> pretty far over what I was thinking, what, what we had laid out, but that's was really important to get this um, effort out. And I think there'll be a lot of uh, follow up um, uh, queries, and will there be other other folks who'll want to watch us at different times and probably have more questions for <laughs> for us. Oh, so, good. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks very much uh, for your attention today. And yeah, we're happy to obviously continue to, to chat and uh, answer questions um, as, as they come in after folks see it.